Part two, chapter ten Filibusters A Fatal Morning Sections two and three. Lemke suddenly came in with rapid steps, accompanied by the chief of police, looked absent mindedly at us, and, taking no notice of us, was about to pass into his study on the right. But Stepan Trofimovitch stood before him, blocking his way. The tall figure of Stepan Trofimovitch, so unlike other people, made an impression. Lemke stopped. Who is this? he muttered, puzzled, as if he were questioning the chief of police, though he did not turn his head towards him and was all the time gazing at Stepan Trofimovitch. Retired college assessor, Stepan Trofimovitch Verkhovensky, Your Excellency, answered Stepan Trofimovitch, bowing majestically. His Excellency went on staring at him with a very blank expression, however. What is it? and with the curtness of a great official he turned his ear to stepan trofimovitch with disdainful impatience taking him for an ordinary person with a written petition of some sort i was visited and my house was searched to-day by an official acting in your excellency's name therefore i am desirous name name lemka asked impatiently seeming suddenly to have an inkling of something stepan trofimovitch repeated his name still more majestically ah it's that hotbed you have shown yourself sir in such a light are you a professor a professor i once had the honour of giving some lectures to the young men of the x university the young men limka seemed to start though i am ready to bet that he grasped very little of what was going on or even perhaps did not know with whom he was talking that sir i won't allow he cried suddenly getting terribly angry i won't allow young men it's all these manifestos it's an assault on society sir a piratical attack filibustering what is your request on the contrary your wife requested me to read something to-morrow at her fete i've not come to make a request but to ask for my rights at the fete there'll be no fete I won't allow your fete. A lecture? A lecture? He screamed furiously. I should be very glad if you would speak to me rather more politely, Your Excellency, without stamping or shouting at me as though I were a boy. Perhaps you understand whom you are speaking to, said Lemke, turning crimson. Perfectly, Your Excellency. I am protecting society while you are destroying it. You. I remember about you, though you used to be a tutor in the house of madame stavrogin yes i was in the position of tutor in the house of madame stavrogin and have been for twenty years the hotbed of all that has now accumulated all the fruits i believe i saw you just now in the square you'd better look out sir you'd better look out your way of thinking is well known you may be sure that i keep my eye on you i cannot allow your lectures sir i cannot don't come with such requests to me he would have passed on again i repeat that your excellency is mistaken it was your wife who asked me to give not a lecture but a literary reading at the fete to-morrow but i decline to do so in any case now i humbly request that you will explain to me if possible how why and for what reason i was subjected to an official search to-day some of my books and papers private letters to me were taken from me and wheeled through the town in a barrel who searched you said lemka starting and returning to full consciousness of the position he suddenly flushed all over he turned quickly to the chief of police at that moment the long stooping and awkward figure of bloom appeared in the doorway why this official here said stepan trofimovitch indicating him bloom came forward with a face that admitted his responsibility but showed no contrition vous ne faites que des bêtises lemka threw at him in a tone of vexation and anger and suddenly he was transformed and completely himself again excuse me he muttered utterly disconcerted and turning absolutely crimson all this all this was probably a mere blunder a misunderstanding nothing but a misunderstanding your excellency observed stepan trofimovitch once when i was young i saw a characteristic incident in the corridor of a theatre a man ran up to another and gave him a sounding smack in the face before the whole public 
perceiving at once that his victim was not the person whom he had intended to chastise but someone quite different who only slightly resembled him he pronounced angrily with the haste of one whose moments are precious as your excellency did just now i've made a mistake excuse me it was a misunderstanding nothing but a misunderstanding and when the offended man remained resentful and cried out he observed to him with extreme annoyance why i tell you it was a misunderstanding what are you crying out about that's that's very amusing of course lemka gave a wry smile but but can't you see how unhappy i am myself he almost screamed and seemed about to hide his face in his hands this unexpected and piteous exclamation almost a sob was almost more than one could bear it was probably the first moment since the previous day that he had full vivid consciousness of all that had happened and it was followed by complete humiliating despair that could not be disguised who knows in another minute he might have sobbed aloud for the first moment stepan trofimovitch looked wildly at him then he suddenly bowed his head and in a voice pregnant with feeling pronounced your excellency don't trouble yourself with my petulant complaint and only give orders for my books and letters to be restored to me he was interrupted at that very instant yulia mihailovna returned and entered noisily with all the party which had accompanied her but at this point i should like to tell my story in as much detail as possible section three in the first place the whole company who had filled three carriages crowded into the waiting-room there was a special entrance to yulia mihailovna's apartments on the left as one entered the house but on this occasion they all went through the waiting-room and i imagine just because stepan trofimovitch was there and because all that had happened to him as well as the spiegelin affair had reached yulia mihailovna's ears as she drove into the town lyamshin who for some misdemeanor had not been invited to join the party and so knew all that had been happening in the town before any one else brought her the news with spiteful glee he hired a wretched cossack nag and hastened on the way to skvoreshniki to meet the returning cavalcade with the diverting intelligence i fancy that in spite of her lofty determination yulia mihailovna was a little disconcerted on hearing such surprising news but probably only for an instant the political aspect of the affair for instance could not cause her uneasiness Pyotr stepanovitch had impressed upon her three or four times that the spiegelin ruffians ought to be flogged and Pyotr stepanovitch certainly had for some time past been a great authority in her eyes but anyway i shall make him pay for it she doubtless reflected the he of course referring to her spouse i must observe in passing that on this occasion as though purposely Pyotr stepanovitch had taken no part in the expedition and no one had seen him all day i must mention too by the way that varvara petrovna had come back to the town with her guests in the same carriage with yulia mihailovna in order to be present at the last meeting of the committee which was arranging the fete for the next day she too must have been interested and perhaps even agitated by the news about stepan trofimovitch communicated by lyamshin the hour of reckoning for andrey antonovitch followed at once alas he felt that from the first glance at his admirable wife with an open air and an enchanting smile she went quickly up to stepan trofimovitch held out her exquisitely gloved hand and greeted him with a perfect shower of flattering phrases as though the only thing she cared about that morning was to make haste to be charming to stepan trofimovitch because at last she saw him in her house there was not one hint of the search that morning it was as though she knew nothing of it there was not one word to her husband not one glance in his direction as though he had not been in the room what's more she promptly confiscated stepan trofimovitch and carried him off to the drawing-room as though he had had no interview with lemka or as though it was not worth prolonging if he had i repeat again i think that in this yulia mihailovna in spite of her aristocratic tone made another great mistake and karmazinov particularly did much to aggravate this he had taken part in the expedition at yulia mihailovna's special request and in that way had incidentally paid his visit to varvara petrovna and she was so poor-spirited as to be perfectly delighted at it on seeing stepan trofimovitch he called out from the doorway 
he came in behind the rest and pressed forward to embrace him even interrupting yulia mikhailovna what years what ages at last excellent ami he made as though to kiss him offering his cheek of course and stepan trofimovitch was so fluttered that he could not avoid saluting it cher he said to me that evening recalling all the events of that day i wondered at that moment which of us was the most contemptible he embracing me only to humiliate me or i despising him and his face and kissing it on the spot though i might have turned away foo come tell me about yourself tell me everything karmazinov drawled and lisped as though it were possible for him on the spur of the moment to give an account of twenty-five years of his life but this foolish trifling was the height of chic remember that the last time we met was at the granovsky dinner in moscow and that twenty-four years have passed since then stepan trofimovitch began very reasonably and consequently not at all in the same chic style ce cher homme karmazinov interrupted with shrill familiarity squeezing his shoulder with exaggerated friendliness make haste and take us to your room yulia mikhailovna there he'll sit down and tell us everything and yet i was never at all intimate with that peevish old woman stepan trofimovitch went on complaining to me that same evening shaking with anger we were almost boys and i'd begun to detest him even then just as he had me of course yulia mikhailovna's drawing-room filled up quickly varvara petrovna was particularly excited though she tried to appear indifferent but i caught her once or twice glancing with hatred at karmazinov and with wrath at stepan trofimovitch the wrath of anticipation the wrath of jealousy and love if stepan trofimovitch had blundered this time and had let karmazinov make him look small before every one i believe she would have leapt up and beaten him i have forgotten to say that liza too was there and i had never seen her more radiant carelessly light-hearted and happy mavriki nikolaevitch was there too of course in the crowd of young ladies and rather vulgar young men who made up yulia mikhailovna's usual retinue and among whom this vulgarity was taken for sprightliness and cheap cynicism for wit i noticed two or three new faces a very obsequious pole who was on a visit in the town a german doctor a sturdy old fellow who kept loudly laughing with great zest at his own wit and lastly a very young princeling from petersburg like an automaton figure with the deportment of a state dignitary and a fearfully high collar but it was evident that yulia mikhailovna had a very high opinion of this visitor and was even a little anxious of the impression her salon was making on him cher monsieur karmazinov said stepan trofimovitch sitting in a picturesque pose on the sofa and suddenly beginning to lisp as daintily as karmazinov himself cher monsieur karmazinov the life of a man of our time and of certain convictions even after an interval of twenty-five years is bound to seem monotonous the german went off into a loud abrupt guffaw like a neigh evidently imagining that stepan trofimovitch had said something exceedingly funny the latter gazed at him with studied amazement but produced no effect on him whatever the prince too looked at the german turning head collar and all towards him and putting up his pince-nez though without the slightest curiosity is bound to seem monotonous stepan trofimovitch intentionally repeated drawling each word as deliberately and nonchalantly as possible and so my life has been throughout this quarter of a century et comme on trouve partout plus de moi que de raison and as i am entirely of this opinion it has come to pass that throughout this quarter of a century i c'est charmant le moi whispered yulia mikhailovna turning to varvara petrovna who was sitting beside her varvara petrovna responded with a look of pride but karmazinov could not stomach the success of the french phrase and quickly and shrilly interrupted stepan trofimovitch as for me i am quite at rest on that score and for the past seven years i've been settled at karlsruhe and last year when it was proposed by the town council to lay down a new water-pipe i felt in my heart that this question of water-pipes in karlsruhe was dearer and closer to my heart than all the questions of my precious fatherland in this period of so-called reform 
i can't help sympathizing though it goes against the grain sighed stepan trofimovitch bowing his head significantly yulia mikhailovna was triumphant the conversation was becoming profound and taking a political turn a drain pipe the doctor inquired in a loud voice a water pipe doctor a water pipe and i positively assisted them in drawing up the plan the doctor went off into a deafening guffaw many people followed his example laughing in the face of the doctor who remained unconscious of it and was highly delighted that every one was laughing you must allow me to differ from you karmazinov yulia mikhailovna hastened to interpose karlsruhe is all very well but you are fond of mystifying people and this time we don't believe you what russian writer has presented so many modern types has brought forward so many contemporary problems has put his finger on the most vital modern points which make up the type of the modern man of action you only you and no one else it's no use your assuring us of your coldness towards your own country and your ardent interest in the water pipes of karlsruhe ha ha yes no doubt lisped karmazinov i have portrayed in the character of pogozhov all the failings of the slavophiles and in the character of nikodimov all the failings of the westerners i say hardly all lyamshin whispered slyly but i do this by the way simply to while away the tedious hours and to satisfy the persistent demands of my fellow countrymen you are probably aware stepan trofimovitch yulia mikhailovna went on enthusiastically that tomorrow we shall have the delight of hearing the charming lines one of the last of semyon yakovlevitch's exquisite literary inspirations it's called merci he announces in this piece that he will write no more that nothing in the world will induce him to if angels from heaven or what's more all the best society were to implore him to change his mind in fact he is laying down the pen for good and this graceful merci is addressed to the public in grateful acknowledgment of the constant enthusiasm with which it has for so many years greeted his unswerving loyalty to true russian thought yulia mikhailovna was the acme of bliss yes i shall make my farewell i shall say my merci and depart and there in karlsruhe i shall close my eyes karmazinov was gradually becoming maudlin like many of our great writers and there are numbers of them amongst us he could not resist praise and began to be limp at once in spite of his penetrating wit but i consider this as pardonable they say that one of our shakespeare's positively blurted out in private conversation that we great men can't do otherwise and so on and what's more was unaware of it there in karlsruhe i shall close my eyes when we have done our duty all that's left for us great men is to make haste to close our eyes without seeking a reward i shall do so too give me the address and i shall come to karlsruhe to visit your tomb said the german laughing immoderately they send corpses by rail nowadays one of the less important young men said unexpectedly lyamshin positively shrieked with delight yulia mikhailovna frowned nikolai stavrogin walked in why well, i was told that you were locked up he said aloud addressing stepan trofimovitch before every one else no it was a case of unlocking jested stepan trofimovitch but i hope that what's happened will have no influence on what i asked you to do yulia mikhailovna put in again i trust that you will not let this unfortunate annoyance of which i had no idea lead you to disappoint our eager expectations and deprive us of the enjoyment of hearing your reading at our literary matinee i don't know i now really i am so unlucky varvara petrovna and only fancy just when i was so longing to make the personal acquaintance of one of the most remarkable and independent intellects of russia and here stepan trofimovitch suddenly talks of deserting us your compliment is uttered so audibly that i ought to pretend not to hear it stepan trofimovitch said neatly but i cannot believe that my insignificant presence is so indispensable at your fete to-morrow however i why you'll spoil him cried pyotr stepanovitch bursting into the room i've only just got him in hand and in one morning he has been searched arrested taken by the collar by a policeman and here ladies are cooing to him in the governor's drawing-room 
every bone in his body is aching with rapture in his wildest dreams he had never hoped for such good fortune now he'll begin informing against the socialists after this impossible pyotr stepanovitch socialism is too grand an idea to be unrecognized by stepan trofimovitch yulia mikhailovna took up the gauntlet with energy it's a great idea but its exponents are not always great men et brisons la mon cher stepan trofimovitch ended addressing his son and rising gracefully from his seat but at this point an utterly unexpected circumstance occurred von lemke had been in the room for some time but seemed unnoticed by any one though everyone had seen him come in in accordance with her former plan yulia mihailovna went on ignoring him he took up his position near the door and with a stern face listened gloomily to the conversation hearing an allusion to the events of the morning he began fidgeting uneasily stared at the prince obviously struck by his stiffly starched prominent collar then suddenly he seemed to start on hearing the voice of pyotr stepanovitch and seeing him burst in and no sooner had stepan trofimovitch uttered his phrase about socialists than lemka went up to him pushing against lyamshin who at once skipped out of the way with an affected gesture of surprise rubbing his shoulder and pretending that he had been terribly bruised enough said von lemke to stepan trofimovitch vigorously gripping the hand of the dismayed gentleman and squeezing it with all his might in both of his enough the filibusters of our day are unmasked not another word measures have been taken he spoke loudly enough to be heard by all the room and concluded with energy the impression he produced was poignant everybody felt that something was wrong i saw yulia mihailovna turn pale the effect was heightened by a trivial accident after announcing that measures had been taken lemka turned sharply and walked quickly towards the door but he had hardly taken two steps when he stumbled over a rug swerved forward and almost fell for a moment he stood still looked at the rug at which he had stumbled and uttering aloud change it went out of the room yulia mihailovna ran after him her exit was followed by an uproar in which it was difficult to distinguish anything some said he was deranged others that he was liable to attacks others put their fingers to their forehead lyamshin in the corner put his two fingers above his forehead people hinted at some domestic difficulties in a whisper of course no one took up his hat all were waiting i don't know what yulia mihailovna managed to do but five minutes later she came back doing her utmost to appear composed she replied evasively that andrey antonovitch was rather excited but that it meant nothing that he had been like that from a child that she knew much better and that the fete next day would certainly cheer him up then followed a few flattering words to stepan trofimovitch simply from civility and a loud invitation to the members of the committee to open the meeting now at once only then all who were not members of the committee prepared to go home but the painful incidents of this fatal day were not yet over i noticed at the moment when nikolai stavrogin came in that liza looked quickly and intently at him and was for a long time unable to take her eyes off him so much so that at last it attracted attention i saw mavriki nikolaevitch bend over her from behind he seemed to mean to whisper something to her but evidently changed his intention and drew himself up quickly looking round at every one with a guilty air nikolai vsevolodovitch too excited curiosity his face was paler than usual and there was a strangely absent-minded look in his eyes after flinging his question at stepan trofimovitch he seemed to forget about him altogether and i really believe he even forgot to speak to his hostess he did not once look at liza not because he did not want to but i am certain because he did not notice her either and suddenly after the brief silence that followed yulia mihailovna's invitation to open the meeting without loss of time liza's musical voice intentionally loud was heard she called to stavrogin nikolai vsevolodovitch a captain who calls himself a relation of yours the brother of your wife and whose name is lebyadkin keeps writing impertinent letters to me complaining of you and offering to tell me some secrets about you if he really is a connection of yours please tell him not to annoy me and save me from this unpleasantness there was a note of desperate challenge in these words everyone realized it the accusation was unmistakable though perhaps it was a surprise to herself 
She was like a man who shuts his eyes and throws himself from the roof. But Nikolai Stavrogin's answer was even more astounding. To begin with, it was strange that he was not in the least surprised and listened to Liza with unruffled attention. There was no trace of either confusion or anger in his face. Simply, firmly, even with an air of perfect readiness, he answered the fatal question. Yes, I have the misfortune to be connected with that man. I have been the husband of his sister for nearly five years. You may be sure I will give him your message as soon as possible, and I'll answer for it that he shan't annoy you again. I shall never forget the horror that was reflected on the face of Varvara Petrovna. With a distracted air she got up from her seat, lifting up her right hand as though to ward off a blow. Nikolai Vsevolodovitch looked at her, looked at Liza, at the spectators, and suddenly smiled with infinite disdain. He walked deliberately out of the room. Everyone saw how Liza leapt up from the sofa as soon as he turned to go and unmistakably made a movement to run after him. But she controlled herself and did not run after him. She went quietly out of the room without saying a word or even looking at anyone accompanied, of course, by Mavriki Nikolaevitch, who rushed after her. The uproar and the gossip that night in the town I will not attempt to describe. Varvara Petrovna shut herself up in her townhouse, and Nikolai Vsevolodovitch, it was said, went straight to Skvoreshniki without seeing his mother. Stepan Trofimovitch sent me that evening to set cher ami to implore her to allow him to come to her, but she would not see me. He was terribly overwhelmed. He shed tears. Such a marriage, such a marriage, such an awful thing in the family, he kept repeating. He remembered Karmazinov, however, and abused him terribly. He set to work vigorously to prepare for the reading, too, and, the artistic temperament, rehearsed before the looking-glass and went over all the jokes and witticisms uttered in the course of his life which he had written down in a separate notebook to insert into his reading next day. My dear, I do this for the sake of a great idea, he said to me, obviously justifying himself. Cher ami, I have been stationary for twenty-five years, and suddenly I've begun to move. Whither, I know not, but I've begun to move. End of part two